Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. People will now have more time to enroll in the Affordable Care Act. And an ASU professor is here to talk about the N-word and its use in American race relations. Plus, Cesar Chavez's fight for migrant farm workers' rights comes to the big screen. We'll talk about how his legacy lives on through his foundation today. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. The Obama administration will give more time to people who say they are unable to enroll in health care plans through the federal insurance marketplace by the March 31st deadline. Here to give us an update on efforts in Arizona is David Aguirre, health care marketplace coordinator with the Greater Phoenix Urban League. He is also a member of the Cover Arizona Coalition. David, welcome to Horizonte. Thank you. Now, this extension uh, is to what? what's the new date? Well, the new date will be April 15th. But it's not for everybody. You have Correct. to. There's some requirements. Tell us what those are. Those are the only requirements will be that you tried to enroll prior to the 31st, and you were not able to. So now you ha they have given you more time to be able to do the, the process. What would you have to show to prove that you tried to enroll before the deadline? Well, actually, what they use in it just kind of like your word, uh, and also the the applications that you have created. If you created a, an account. That's what they're going to be looking at, but mostly it'll be on your own word. And uh, b before we go into the details of what your organization is doing to try and get people signed up, where do we stand right now? How many people have signed up? Well, so far nationwide, we have enrolled over uh, 5, 000, 5, 5 million people. And so that's kind of like a good number. We were looking to do like 6 million, and I think we might hit the mark, but we, we are working very hard to get there. What about all the computer problems that plagued the rollout of the Affordable Care Act? That was uh, something at the beginning that kind of played out and, and, and was fixed. And, and now lately we've been having pretty good luck with the, with the system itself. How much impact do you think President Obama's personal involvement has had? He's, he's been traveling to the country. He's been appearing with athletes. There have been commercials with, with famous figures talking about this. Has that helped? I believe so, uh, because it, the late, the last uh, few weeks has been kind of like people running in and trying to get more information, asking questions, and, and they're more out there trying to get in, in, enrolled. So let's talk now about what the Phoenix Urban League is doing to try and get people enrolled in the Affordable Care Act. Well, we, uh, we have extended our hours to make sure that people that are working, they have a little bit extra time to come to our office and, and, and get help. We've also been working with different agencies through the Cover Arizona Coalition to get people uh, to some different times, uh, weekends, nights, uh, early mornings, all that, to make sure that everybody has a fair chance in, in getting enrolled. What, what is the Cover Arizona Coalition? The Cover Arizona Coalition is a, a coalition of uh, uh, members, different agencies, uh, uh, state and local agencies that uh, have been working together to uh, bring they well we, we all work together to bring the message out to the community we work on strategies what's working what's not working and then we meet on a regular basis to to see where we're at and and look at the and all all the efforts and everything that we are doing as a coalition or in, in individual agencies what are you doing to reach out to the to the latino community well we we've been going through different uh, media uh, that uh, is on the spanish uh, media We've been doing a lot of that, but also we've been working with uh, uh, like the different newspaper, the different like grocery stores, the different uh, uh, beauty salons, and everywhere where there's uh, Hispanics, we are there trying to give them the message. And we ourselves also have uh, in enough people that speak uh, uh, Spanish as well. And, and how well is it working? Because you see on, on the various news programs, suggestion that the Latinos are reluctant to uh, sign up for government programs. Some people may be concerned about being questioned about their immigration status and so forth and, and some of it's cultural. Are you running into any of those kinds of issues? We have not, not as much as uh, some of the media is, is bringing it out because almost everyone that we have helped, I mean, they come in and they're very open. I think it has to do with culture, who's helping them, who's on the other side of the table. That makes a big difference. So I believe that that's what really the key to, to get them enrolled is that they understand. They understand the, the whole process. They understand what the information is going to be used for. 
other than just that what they hear uh, on some of the media. Now, you've indicated that overall the, the effort may reach the number of people they were hoping to reach. What about the Latino population itself? Are you on target or, or the no, results we're, disappointing? We are, we are a little uh, low on numbers as far as the Latino community. And um, we've been doing all we can to, to get them. Uh, we have uh, covered a few events over the weekend. Like last weekend, we had a, an event where we brought in almost like three, I believe like 3,000 people. We had a line out the door for people trying to enroll. Uh, in our office, I mean, we have every day, we, from the time we open to sometimes we stay in until 8, 9 o'clock this whole week to get people enrolled. And, and the majority are Latinos. And how much of a difference do you think the extended deadline is going to make? I think it'll be, make a big difference if people really, the ones that already went through the process and wait a little bit and let the other people kind of like go, go in, I think that'll make a big difference. Well, David, good luck. A lot of work ahead of you in the next week or so. Thanks for joining us on Horizonte. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Here at Horizonte, we want to hear from you. If you have comments, story ideas, or questions, email us at horizonte at asu.edu. To find out more information about what's on Horizonte, go to azpbs.org and click on the Horizonte tab at the top of the screen. There you can access many features to become a more informed Horizonte viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or by scrolling down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. Learn about more specific topics like arts and culture and immigration. You can also find out what's on Horizonte for the upcoming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or you want to buy a video, that's all on our website too. Other features include our collection of website links and a special page for educators. While you're there, show your support for Horizonte with just one click. Discover all that's on Horizonte. Visit azpbs.org, Horizonte, today. Project Humanities was first launched in February 2011 with the purpose of examining humanity through the lens of humanities disciplines and science. Part of the department's spring 2014 kickoff involved film screenings and talks on topics like the N-word, described as easily the most inflammatory, shocking, and historic word in the English language. Here now to talk about the topic is Dr. Neil Lester, ASU Foundation Professor of English and Director of Project Humanities. Dr. Lester, thanks for joining us on Horizonte. This is certainly an inflammatory topic to even be talking about. Um, how did you come about to, to, to address this? What was the motivation? When did you start? Well, I, I study uh, race relations and African American literature, and I also study children's literature. But I also, in the course of doing that, I look at what's happening in the world so that whatever I'm teaching, studying, has some relevance both to me but also to the students. And in particular, in 2008, President, or then Senator Obama was running for president, and I noticed that that word was proliferating on websites that had specifically to do with him. And I thought that we were so allegedly, as a country, integrated, I wanted to tease out exactly what was going on. Was this another 60s movement or what was happening? And so were you, did you do some investigation and then that's what led to teaching the class? Well, I, I, I wanted to know more about it because what I heard was that this was a generational thing, that old people with gray hair like mine didn't quite understand that the new generation was using it differently. And my research showed that that was not the case, that this was not a word that was necessarily universally perceived and used by one generation or the other. What it showed me also is that what we allege as being integrated may not be quite as integrated as we think. So it was a way of uncovering but also discovering. So you start teaching the class and as I understand it's evolved since then but, but part of what you were doing at the beginning was figuring out how you teach a class on this subject. Yes. Well and, and what was clear is that the, the class is not about a word. A word is symptomatic of other things. So the word is about identity, the word is about self-expression, the word is about performance. And so all of those things became part of what we talked about, not how to say it, not whether you should, it wasn't a debate, but rather what is it about language that represents our realities or misrepresents our realities and who are the hour when we talk about that. So it really became a class about language, a class about identity, and a class about performance, but also a class about American history. And how do you teach? the history of, of the N-word and, and what it means? 
Well, the history is, is in my case, since I'm not a historian, but we're rather a literary scholar, is I teach it through things. So I th use it as a way of looking at children's text. And so we look at some of the nursery rhymes from the 1800s. We look at minstrel songs that have become Disney tunes that use that word in that second and third verse, like Polly Wally Doodle or Oh Susanna or Jim Crack Corn. And those were songs that many people my age grew up on and now have become Disney favorites. And people say, but it's that third and, and second verse that we don't sing. And my response to that is it doesn't make it not there because we don't sing it. We may not sing the second verse of the Negro National Anthem, but it doesn't mean it's not there. So I look at this not through looking at dates, but rather looking at the ways in which it has permeated American culture from the 1600s up through the present. And what kind of reaction do you get from the students in your classes? Well, they're, they're surprised because the history is not something that they are aware of. It's something that they certainly haven't lived through and they feel a kind of disconnection from that. So partly what I try to do is say once we know these things, it doesn't mean that the song goes away. It means that when that song comes up, you have something else to connect with that song that's here, is historically accurate. Now you said that the origins of the class were um, the election campaign of 2008, yes. and, and you found that, that the word was being used. You were surprised that it was yes. being used, at yes. least the way it was. Yes. Um, after the president was elected, uh, there was a lot of talk about us being in a post-racial oh. era. Things better or worse? <laughs> well, I'm still not quite sure what that means because to hear some people say it, and, and, and disturbingly so, uh, on multiple sides of the racial divide, that yes, the election of President Obama means that we have looked past race. But I don't know if that's necessarily an ideal that America is looking toward or trying to achieve. What I have noticed, however, is that there has been more racial violence and more attitudes toward this particular word as it expresses racial violence than in years that I was aware of before 2008. So I'm not quite sure, the, the question is rather how do we measure that progress? Uh, many have said that it's because President Obama is in a place that many could not imagine that we see more of this kind of racially uh, problematic uh, bias surfacing. So I don't know if we're better. I, I do hope that people start paying attention to language though, because language such as this reflects how we think or how we don't think. You're talking about what, what people may be trying to achieve. I, I know that one of the commentators, I don't know if he was referring specifically to your class, but this topic said, wouldn't it be great if at some point in the future, people had to ask, well, what does that word mean? Mm -hmm. From talking to you off stage, uh, my understanding is, is, is you don't think that would be a good thing. You want people to know what it meant, and the problem is people don't understand what it means. Well, I, I, I think we have to figure out who those people are, because I think grown people, who are people who are, who are older than I, uh, know about the history that's associated with that word. Black people, white people know that. There, nobody's confused about what this word means. What's confusing, however, is the generation of students who come into my classroom, the older I get, the younger they become. And they really are disconnected from things like Jim Crow. I've experienced that myself, by the way, the age gap. <laughs> and if they're, if they're disconnected from Jim Crow and the nonsensical laws that were created about black cemeteries and black hospitals and white water fountains, then they're also disconnected about slavery. And while we're not suggesting that we are you know, trying to keep history alive, what we are trying to say, those who teach this kind of, of topic, is that that history is not dead. That history is not something that can be boxed and put on a shelf and put away. That history is still very present today in other kinds of manifestations. And that's the thing that surprises the students most. And you're not trying to get people to stop using the word. I mean, that's not your goal. You want them to understand what they're doing. I want people to think about words. And as an English teacher, I want people to think about the words they use. And when I hear uh, young people, and I mean young people who are middle school, high school, or college say, well, I don't even think about it, that worries me. Because if, for example, we have been so influenced by Disney that we can't imagine a Cinderella who isn't blonde and wearing a blue dress, then we've been indoctrinated in ways that are very, very dangerous. And the same thing comes with language. If we use a language that we don't think about, then that means the language is controlling us and we are not controlling the language. What kind of reaction have you gotten from the people in your classes or in some of the lecture audiences that you've had? Well, the, the audiences have been different and diverse. And so students in the class who self-select, this is not a required course, are actually quite amazed and they amazed at what they discover. 
because they've heard the word and they have family members or friends who use the word and they themselves may have used the word. But once they get through this, they feel like they have some ammunition when people first of all ask, why are you taking a class like that? But also when they hear their friends who are in circles that I'm not in or other African Americans, they have things to say, you know, maybe you should think about your use of that word. That's been very gratifying. So the purpose of the class is not to convince people to do one thing or the other, but to make people more aware. And you hope that in making them aware, they start thinking. And that's not just for the classroom, but also for audiences who are in churches or art centers or beauty shops and barber shops. How do you make people aware? Dr. Neil Lester, thank you for joining us on the show to hopefully accomplish that a little bit. Thank Help you very much for inviting people aware. Thank, thank you. you. This month, people are celebrating the life of civil rights leader and farm worker Cesar Chavez. Chavez founded the United Farm Workers Union and led walkouts of Arizona's fields in the campaign for better treatment of migrant field workers. We'll talk about his legacy today in a moment, but first, here's a clip of the Cesar Chavez film set to premiere tomorrow. The day you came into this world, I received the clarity that I so desperately needed. And I hope that one day, you can be as proud of me as I am of you. Interesting day you choose to be late. I come here out of respect for one of the heroic figures of our time, Cesar Chavez. I was born in Yuma, Arizona, in a ranch owned by my family. Uh, but we lost it in the Depression. That's where I witnessed the injustice suffered by the people. To be successful, we have to have an army of boycotters willing to do the hard work. The bigger the army, the bigger the success. Farm workers in Delano, California, have begun an unprecedented strike in the Central Valley. The citizens of Delano, they respect the law. So do we, especially the Bill of Rights. Have you seen the headlines they're getting? That's costing us real money, Mr. Bogdanovich. We don't have to negotiate. We have to dictate terms. Caesar, they will shoot. We're going to break this damn strike. It's all lies. They're saying the strike is not legal. They're painting us to look like criminals. I failed you as a leader, and I will fast until everyone makes a pledge recommitting themselves to nonviolence. Does he know what he's doing to you? No, he doesn't. They've been coming in bigger numbers ever since Chavez quit eating. How long can a man go without food? It depends on the man, John. Everything depends on the man. Once social change begins, it can't be reversed. You can't humiliate someone who has pride. And you can't oppress someone who's not afraid anymore. Here now to talk about the film and Cesar Chavez's legacy is Michael Nowakowski, Vice President of the Communication Fund under the Cesar Chavez Foundation Radio Network, founded by Cesar Chavez. He's also the City of Phoenix Councilman for District 7. Councilman Nowakowski, welcome to Horizonte. Oh, thank you, Jose. Um, you, you know, the surprise is not that a movie's been made about Cesar Chavez, but, but that it took so long to make one. You know, it's 21 years since his death. April 23rd is gonna be his 21st anniversary. But you know what's interesting is that Diego Luna, that happens to be a Mexican star and director, had a son here in California. And he started looking up, because he had a Mexican-American son, he goes, started looking up in the history books about Mexican-American heroes. And all of a sudden, Cesar Chavez kept on coming up. So I went to the, look for movies or videos, and there was nothing on them. So I decided to do something, he said. So he came to the Cesar Chavez Foundation, talked to Paul Chavez, the president of the foundation, that happens to be Caesar's son, said, I'd like to make a movie on your dad. And here's the, the beginning of a script. So they started working together and they started adding stories and all of a sudden this movie came about after four years of just sitting around a table like this and having conversations. Were there any particular barriers that, that they were running into either for funding or in, in terms of getting support from the studio? You know what was so amazing about it is that the funding came really quick that we thought we were gonna struggle in finding the funding, but um, 
there was more than enough money to make this movie. What about getting people to play the roles? Um, there's some big names in this movie, and, and, and the casting, at least from the clip, right. looks terrific. I know you've seen the movie, so right. I want to ask you about that later, but, but uh, uh, what about the cast? Well, we have a grower that's John Malkovich, that's a great actor. We have, starring as Cesar Chavez, Michael Peña, one of the great up-and-coming Latino artists, um, um, Ros Rosario Dawson, that's Dolores Huerta, Helen Chavez is America. So we have a lot of great Latino leaders and Latino actors and also non-Latino actors that, you know, John F uh, Robert Kennedy and, and John Malkovich that was in there too. So it's a mixture of great people. And it's a great historic story, which you were involved in right. for a number of years. And, and so this may be an un unfair question, but what's your unbiased opinion of the quality of the movie? You know what, I, th I was amazed on the quality of the movie, but what's most important about the movie is the history part of it. And if you're from Arizona, you're just gonna be amazed because Caesar was actually born here. Caesar um, passed away here, and one of his fasts were actually done just about a mile and a half from this studio at Santa Rita um, Center. And, and we know that even the movies that uh, try as best they can to be true to the true story, at times, they, they, in part because it's a movie, they right. have to take some poetic license. Was there anything about the movie that you thought didn't ring quite true? You know what, not really. Um, there was some stuff in the movie that just rejogged your memory, like when he went to Europe and continued the boycott of grapes in Europe and how, the, how England was really the key part of, of, of breaking the boycott and uh, making it successful. So it's just different historic parts that you don't really remember and how President Reagan and played a role in it and Nixon and it's just amazing. So I, I like people to go watch it. But also the movie was a movie of three different stories. It was about a man that was struggling to build a union. It was a man that was struggling to be a father that was being an organizer and a leader and how he had to leave his son and allow his son to go live with his grandmother because he wasn't paying enough attention and that tension between the, a kid trying to get, a, t a son trying to get attention from the father and then the whole growers aspect of it too. So there's three different lines and I think it really relates to everyone. If you're a business owner or if you're a, a, a grower, you relate to that part of it. If you're a community leader like yourself, um, you have to spend a lot of time in the community away from your family and the sacrifices that your family has to give up. Um, not having their dad there, and that's that story's in there. So I think there's something for everybody in this movie. What are the parts of the movie that, that people are going to go to, and, and, and we're talking about people, let's say, who mm -hmm. feel that they're pretty knowledgeable about the Cesar Chavez story. What are the parts where they're going to say, I didn't know that, and I'm surprised? I think um, one of the parts is um, Robert Kennedy, when they actually had some hearings over there in, in California, and Robert Kennedy asked the sheriff that he should read the Constitution during the break, um, their lunch break. The other thing is where um, the boycott was being very successful here in the United States, but then the, um, the growers convinced the president at that time to sell the grapes overseas. And they created, um, they created a, another market for the grapes to be sold overseas. So Caesar had to go overseas to continue the boycott there and how the European market supported the boycott. And that's what really brought the negotiations um, to the fullest and the contracts were actually signed because the Europeans came on board and supported the boycott also. So how does Arizona fare in the movie? It, it was his birthplace, it's also the place that he died. Uh, and, and while most of his unionizing activity was in California, Arizona was a part of the story. How do we look? You know what, we look really good because at the very beginning of the story, we talk about Arizona and at the end about his death. But I think one of the key things that wasn't talked about in the movie, that the word Si Se Puede, or the, the slogan Si Se Puede, was actually coined here at Santa Rita um, Hall when the um, 1972 fast was going on. What happened was Dolores Huerta approached Caesar during the fast and said, S Caesar asked Dolores, How, what's people saying out there? How's, how's the fast going? Well, Caesar, people are saying que no se puede, that it's not possible here in Arizona to, to break the crazy laws and, and the injustices that are going on with the farm workers. And then Caesar turned around and told Dolores, Dolores, you go out there and tell people que si se puede, 
que sí se puede en Arizona, that yes, we can, we can do it here in Arizona. So I think that's a portion of history that's here from Arizona. And I think what's so important about this whole movie, it's an American story. And especially being a Mexican-American, it really brings us to our roots. Because somebody or someone in our family always was a farm worker at one time. And um, I think it's really important for our children to see this movie, especially to realize that where, our, where we came from. We came from the fields. Councilman, we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, just probably the most important detail right at the moment. The movie pre premieres tonight at midnight, is that right? Oh, absolutely. We're going to actually have it at Westgate. And we, we rented out all the theaters, so hopefully we can get 3,000 people out there to watch the movie. It's going to be the first time, the first time viewing in the whole United States at midnight. And we're asking everybody to go out Friday, Saturday, Sunday to any of the AMC or any of the theaters out there. Well, we it's, look forward to seeing it. And right. thank you so much for joining us on Nori Sante to talk uh, about. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's our show for tonight. From all of us here at 8 Arizona PBS and Horizonte, I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good night. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.